Chapter 17, Global Affairs. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about in this lecture is how the United States goes about engaging with the rest of the world, how the U.S. government creates foreign policy, how it makes decisions about how it's going to engage with other countries in the world. Okay, so the first question uh, we should take up is, why does, why does the United States engage in global affairs? And the answer to that is pretty simple, to pursue its national interests and to keep the nation secure. And what do I mean by national interests? What the United States wants to accomplish uh, in order to keep itself safe and secure, how it's going to go about building friendships and alliances with other countries in the world, how it's going to deal with other countries that it views as enemies, uh, as opponents. And so all of those things uh, go into explaining why and how the United States engages in global affairs in the way that it does. Ever since the U.S. became a nation, uh, all the way back to the time when George Washington was the first president, Americans have argued about how we should engage with the world. And there are basically three schools of thought, three different schools of thought, three different ways of looking at engagement in the world. One, of, one group of people uh, that we can call internationalists believe that the U.S. should be actively, actively involved in the world, not only to defend U.S. interests, but also to promote American values such as democracy, individual freedom, etc. So internationalists believe that the U.S. should have a very robust, very active engagement in the world in order not just to defend our own interests and to defend our own safety, but also to aggressively promote American values uh, these are people that would say, well, what makes America great, what makes America such a special country is that we are a democratic country that believes in giving people freedom, that uh, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, things like that. And so what the U.S. should be doing is making, trying to make other countries in the world be like we are, trying to promote these values of freedom all around the world. And so in order to do that, we have to be actively engaged in the world. We have to uh, be good to our friends. We also have to confront our enemies and be a very strong, uh, active country in the world, especially because we are now the most powerful country in the world militarily and the richest country in the world economically. So that's what internationalists believe. Isolationists believe pretty much uh, the complete opposite of internationalists. Isolationists believe that the U.S. should not be actively involved in the world and that it should only defend its own safety from external threats. So isolationists would say that the U.S. doesn't really have uh, a, an interest in most of what goes on in the world. The U.S. should not be butting into other people's problems, that we should be spending our money at home, taking care of our own people rather than spending money on uh, foreign aid to other countries uh, because actively being involved in the rest of the world uh, actually can hurt us because that's what gets us into wars. That if we weren't so engaged in the rest of the world, if we weren't so actively involved in the rest of the world, if the rest of the world, uh, people that don't like us didn't see us as bullies because we were so actively involved in the world, we'd be much safer. 
we'd have uh, much more money to spend at home. Uh, and frankly, uh, we wouldn't put American soldiers at risk. And we'd be safer because the rest of the world wouldn't see us as bullies and we wouldn't be such a target for terrorism and things like that. So that's what isolationists believe, that we should be more isolated within our own country, with our own borders, and that we should only uh, use the military to defend ourselves when we are actively threatened or attacked. Uh, realists believe more like internationalists that the U.S. should be actively engaged in the world to defend U.S. interests, but not so much to defend and promote American values uh, and that we should be engaged in the world even if that means supporting nations that do not represent American values. So uh, it's not that realists don't believe that America is good and special uh, because we uh, hold dear to these values of democracy and individual freedom, but that it's not the purpose of the U.S. It should not be the purpose and goal of the U.S. to actively promote these values. The only purpose of American foreign policy of our engagement in global affairs should be to defend our own interests, to defend our own safety, uh, and sometimes that means uh, helping and supporting nations that do not represent our own American values. And so a, a good example of this would be that during the Cold War, uh, the period after World War II when the U.S. and the Soviet Union were enemies uh, and vying for uh, control of the world, uh, the United States uh, allied itself with many, many countries that were not democratic, that did not promote American values, and uh, we didn't care really because the these countries opposed the Soviet Union, we opposed the Soviet Union, so therefore it was in our interest to work and support these allies, uh, and we did not really complain when these countries brutally uh, treated their own people the way they did, when these countries did not give their uh, people the same kind of freedoms uh, that we do here. So... Uh, that's the more realist perspective that we need to deal with the world uh, in a real way. Uh, we need to see the world as it really is. And so the world is not ideal. We cannot go around trying to promote American values uh, because that may not be in our best interest. Uh, even though we'd love to see other countries promote our values, uh, we should not be uh, putting ourselves at risk and our money at risk in order to do that. But at the same time, realists would also argue that isolationism is not a realistic goal either because uh, just being isolated within our borders is not going to mean that we don't have enemies. People are going to come after us. Other countries are going to come after us no matter what, even if we are isolationists. So we have to be active in the world uh, and we need to uh, be as safe as we can be, even if that means supporting nations that do not represent our values, that do things that we find morally wrong, like t brutalizing their own people, torturing their own people. That's just the way it is, realists would say, that we can't solve all the world's problems. Our main goal should be to protect ourselves as best we can. So those are the three basic uh, goal, basic uh, schools of thought when it comes to how the U.S. should be engaged in foreign policy uh, that differ from each other. So when it comes to pursuing its interests, when it comes to trying to achieve its foreign policy goals, and the main one, remember, is to keep us safe from uh, those that would do harm to us, 
the United States has three tools it can use to pursue its foreign and defense policy goals. One of those goals is diplomatic. One of those goals is economic. And the other goal is military. So diplomatic goals, uh, use of diplomacy. Diplomacy means to talk and negotiate with other countries with the goal of solving our problems with 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 the goal of uh, coming to agreements with other countries through peaceful negotiation, through discussion, through talking. And so, uh, for example, if the United States uh, and uh, Egypt, for example, have a difference of opinion, have an argument. Both countries sit down, the leadership of both countries sit down, they discuss their differences, they come to a negotiation, they sign an agreement that peacefully resolves their uh, arguments uh, and their problems uh, so that they can both now get along. And so you, diplomacy is using discussion, talking, negotiation, and the making of agreements to solve problems peacefully. Now, that's not always possible. And so diplomacy is usually the first step that the United States tries to use to solve problems that it has with other countries to, to negotiate uh, uh, disagreements to make compromises but that's not always possible diplomacy doesn't always uh, solve the problem so the next step that the United States has is to use its economic tools uh, economic leverage meaning economic pressure and what that uh, there are two ways that the United States can do that one is to offer economic support uh, to another country to do something that we want them to do or to not do something that we don't want them to do. So, for example, uh, if uh, so, right now Iran uh, is believed to be trying to build nuclear weapons. And this is something that the United States government does not want Iran to do. And at the same time, uh, a lot of countries that are allied with the United States, European countries, Canada, other countries around the world, in Asia, are doing business with uh, Iran, or buying things from Iran and selling things to Iran. So one of the things the United States wants uh, wants to do is to convince these other countries, these allies of ours, to stop doing business with Iran until Iran stops trying to build a nuclear weapon. So one of the things the United States can do is to to try to get them to do that is to use economic leverage in the form of economic aid, economic support, say, look, we will give you more money. We will provide more foreign aid to you, or we will buy more of your goods from you, which is good for you economically, if you stop doing business with Iran. And, and so if you sell uh, corn to Iran, uh, please stop selling corn to Iran, and we'll buy all the corn that you used to sell to Iran so that you're not out economically. You still sell the same amount of corn, we'll just buy it from you instead. And so that's one way that the United States can use economic leverage, economic pressure, economic tools to uh, pursue its foreign policy goals. Uh, another way that the U.S. can use economic leverage is to try to use economic punishment, what are called sanctions, S A N. T I O N S, economic sanctions. And so uh, when the United States determined that Iran was trying to build a nuclear weapon, the United States began to employ sanctions on Iran uh, so that Iran could no longer do business with a lot of American companies, could no longer do business with American banks 
could no longer do business with the American military. And so uh, the idea is that you use economic sanctions, economic punishment to get a country to stop doing what it's doing in the same way that uh, a parent will punish a child who is doing something wrong so that they stop doing whatever, whatever it is. And so economic tools can either be positive in the sense of we'll give you this money to either do something we want you to do or not do something we don't want you to do that's in our, that we feel is in our interest. Or on the other side of the same coin, uh, economic punishment, economic sanctions is uh, we will stop doing business with you. Uh, we will stop having e economic relations with you until you stop doing what we don't like you doing. And then uh, so that sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't work. But if both diplomacy and economic leverage fails, then the third option is military, uh, the use of military force. Uh, to stop a country from doing something that we don't want it to do. Uh, so uh, a good example of how these uh, three tools can be used uh, in progression at the same time uh, is the example of the first Iraq war in uh, 1991 when the U.S. Uh, invaded Iraq to uh, get Iraq to uh, pull out of Kuwait after its invasion of Kuwait. So uh, this whole thing started in August of 1990 when Iraq, uh, for uh, several reasons, invaded Kuwait. A small country just to the south of, of Iraq. Uh, as soon as that happened, the United States and the U United Nations uh, said uh, this is unacceptable and uh, it called uh, on Iraq to remove its troops from Kuwait and to relinquish its control of Kuwait. The leader of Kuwait at the time, Saddam Hussein, said, no, we have a right, we, we, we have uh, legitimate grievances against Kuwait, and uh, so we are not going to remove our troops. And so that's when the United States and the rest of the world, through the United Nations, tried to use diplomacy. They uh, began to sit down with Kuwait's leadership to try to negotiate a deal that would remove uh, Iraq from uh, Kuwait. Uh, halfway through these negotiations, it it became clear that uh, they were not going to succeed, and so the United States implemented economic sanctions on Kuwait. I mean, on Iraq, in order to use economic pressure, economic tools economic punishment to get Saddam Hussein to remove Iraqi troops from Kuwait. That didn't work, and so in January of 1991, the United States, in, in uh, tandem with the United Nations, invaded Kuwait invaded Iraq, uh, well, first Kuwait, but then Iraq, in order to remove uh, Iraqi troops from uh, Kuwait. And that was successful. The U.S. was able to succeed in using military force in conjunction with, other, with many other countries around the world, Canada, uh, uh, Europe, European countries, Japan, uh, and they succeeded in removing uh, Iraqi troops from Kuwait, but it took uh, a progression of all three of these tools, first diplomatic, then economic, then military, to get Iraq to leave uh, Kuwait. Uh, and uh, very often the United States succeed, it succeeds in using 
these kinds of pressures, especially economic and military, because the United States is today the world's richest nation, uh, and it's the, the nation with the strongest military. Uh, so who makes foreign policy decisions for the U.S.? Who decides uh, whether uh, the United States is going to invade another country or whether it's the right time to use economic sanctions or how to engage in diplomacy or what countries to be friendly with or not friendly with? Uh, who makes these kinds of foreign policy decisions for the U.S.? Well, several different groups of people individuals and groups of people involved, beginning with the president, and ultimately the president is the chief decider. Uh, he makes the final decisions, the final foreign policy decisions for the United States. Uh, the president, uh, but also the president uh, is assisted in these making these decisions by the vice president, by the secretary of state, who's the chief uh, diplomatic officer of the United States. The Secretary of State is in charge of the State Department, which is mainly in charge of maintaining our relationships with foreign countries. The Secretary of the uh, State Department has ambassadors around the world in every country in the world that we have relationships with uh, that operate as the main uh, representative of the United States in that country. Uh, also, the Secretary of Defense and the Joint Chief of Staff, the Secretary of Defense is the the main civilian leader of our military. Uh, the Secretary of Defense is in charge of the Defense Department, and the Joint Chief of Staff are the main military leaders, the top military leaders of the U.S. military. Uh, there is a chief of staff for every branch of the military. So we've got a chief of staff for the Army, the chief of staff of the Navy, the chief of staff of the Marines, and the chief of staff for the Air Force. And so all those chief of staff together form what's called the Joint Chief of Staff, the main military leadership that uh, offers advice to the Secretary of Defense the vice president and the president. And the head of that Joint Chief of Staff is called the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. And that person, the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, is basically the main military advisor to the president and the vice president. And then there's also the National Security Advisor and the National Security Council. The National Security Council is a group of people that work in the White House uh, that represent all the foreign policy agencies of the U.S. government. And we're talking now about the military, the State Department, the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, which is a spy agency that I'll talk about in a little bit. And all these groups together all these agencies together have these representatives at the National Security Council who talk over certain issues and uh, try to form uh, a set of opinions and advice that are presented to the president and vice president so that the president can make a decision about how best to deal with the situation. And the head of the National Security Council is the National Security Advisor who is a very close advisor of the president when it comes to decisions about foreign policy and military policy. So all of these people and groups are involved in making foreign policy decisions for the United States. Now, Congress also plays an important role in making foreign policy decisions because only Congress, for example, can declare war. Uh, the Constitution clearly states that only Congress can declare war against another country. 
Also, as I've mentioned before, this only uh, the Senate must ratify treaties. So the president can sign and negotiate a formal agreement with a foreign country, a treaty, but that treaty does not have any uh, any uh, force. It's not official until the Senate ratifies it. So that's a very important role that the Senate, uh, the part of Congress that is the Senate, has when it comes to making foreign policy decisions, when it comes to uh, deciding how the United States is going to engage with other countries in the world. And very importantly, only Congress can provide funding for foreign policy actions. So the president can say that uh, I want to uh, increase the amount of military aid we give to another country that's a friend of ours, or the United, or the president can say, I want to put more troops into Afghanistan or Iraq, but he can't do that without Congress's, uh, ultimately he can't do that without Congress's approval because only Congress can provide funding for foreign policy actions. Everything the president wants to do in the realm of foreign affairs costs money, and according to the Constitution, only Congress can authorize the spending of money. Only Congress can declare that we're going to fund one thing or another. Now, even though Congress plays an important role, the fact that the president and Congress both have important roles when it comes to making foreign policy decisions can be uh, unclear, can create confusion, because the Constitution does not clearly draw a line between executive and congressional authority. It does not clearly say how the president and Congress have to work together or what happens if they disagree. For example, only Congress can declare war, right? Okay, that's true. But the Constitution also says that the President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. military forces, which means that the military only takes orders from the president. And so the president can order military troops to go into another country, to invade another country. And he can do that whether or not Congress declares war. On the same token, Congress can declare war, but if the president doesn't want to send military force against the country that Congress declares war against, he doesn't really have to because Congress cannot order the military to do anything. Only the president can. And so even though Congress can can only, uh, uh, even though only Congress can declare war, in the past 75 years, since World War II, the United States is involved in many undeclared wars where the president has sent military troops into a combat situation without Congress having declared war. The first Gulf War that I just mentioned was not a declared war. Congress never declared war against Iraq. Now, what they did do was authorize the, the president to use a military force. But even if they didn't, even if Congress did not authorize the president to use a military force, it wouldn't stop the president at least initially from using military troops the way he wants, wanted to. Uh, the last time Congress actually did declare war against any country was in December of 1941, right after Pearl Harbor, when the United States declared war against Japan, uh, right after Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. So uh, the U.S. 
uh, Constitution is not clear uh, about where the line is between executive and congressional authority when it comes to military affairs and foreign policy decisions. Uh, and uh, as we, uh, as, as, as I've discussed before, since World War II, uh, the powers of the presidency have increased and the power of Congress has decreased. So today, when it comes to the role of foreign policy and military policy, the president is much more powerful than Congress, even though both have an important role in making foreign policy decisions. Now, making good foreign policy decisions also requires good intelligence. And what I mean by intelligence is information. Uh, You want to know what other countries around the world are doing, especially countries that you're not on on a good relationship with. Uh, you don't want to be caught by surprise, especially if other countries mean to do you harm or attack you. So the U.S. has several foreign intelligence gathering services that uh, work to collect information uh, on foreign nations. Uh, and these are uh, just the, some of them, and the most important. They're not all the all the ones that we have, but these are the most important ones that we should talk about: the State Department, the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation (FBI). So the State Department we talked about before, so the State Department is in charge of maintaining our relationship with other countries in the world. The U.S. has embassies around the world that work to represent U.S. interests and communicate with other countries as the first point of communication around the world. These embassies uh, are led by an ambassador who's our chief representative to other countries around the world. Uh, But those uh, embassies also have uh, people whose job is to collect intelligence in a very public way. Uh, So we're not talking about spying uh, uh, secret kinds of intelligence gathering, but uh, public information gathering that's maintained by speaking with representatives from the other government openly, negotiating with other uh, governments, reading newspapers and listening to the radio to find out what uh, the public opinion of the other country is. And so this is the way that the State Department very openly and very publicly and in a very transparent way collects information about foreign countries. And at the same time this is happening, other countries have their embassies here in in Washington, D.C., and they're doing the same thing, collecting information about us to try to figure out what's going on with the election, who's likely to win the next election, and things like that. By reading newspapers, looking at public opinion polls, and things like that. Uh, the U.S. also has this as the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, whose job it is to work secretly to collect uh, information, foreign information, uh, and this is done by spying. So the U.S. has spies around the world uh, who uh, secretly try to gain information from other countries that other countries don't want us to have. And so CIA CIA spies work every day to secretly basically steal information that would help us uh, have a better idea what other countries in the world are doing, not just our enemies, but also our friends. Uh, We spy on our friends and our friends spy on us. So other countries in the world have spies here in the United States right now. Uh, and we may not even know who they are who are trying to collect secret, secretly collect information on us. 
Uh, so the Central Intelligence Agency does this mes mostly through human spying, through human spies who uh, secretly work in other countries uh, uh, with uh, secret identities. The National Security Agency, the NSA, is another spying agency, one that not that, that doesn't work through human intelligence, through uh, having human spies try to steal information. Uh, instead, the National Security Agency works with digital and electronic spying sources, so wiretapping, uh, hacking internet, uh, hacking computers. Uh, that's the kind of uh, work that the NSA does to steal information from other countries uh, so that we have a better idea what they're doing. Uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the DIA, is another uh, intelligence agency that uh, that is uh, part of the military. And what they do is they uh, try to analyze defense-related secrets that could be stolen either by the CIA or the NSA, so like maps. Uh, and information related to weapon systems, anything related to military intelligence is what the DIA deals with. And uh, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, also engages in foreign intelligence gathering, even though the FBI's main job is to serve as the nation's uh, top federal law enforcement agency. The FBI is the federal government's police force. They serve the federal government. The FBI also, from time to time, will send agents around the world to collect intelligence on uh, foreign-based crimes. Uh, and so that's very different from what these other agencies do, which is more foreign uh, policy-related. The FBI is more criminal-related, uh, their job is to investigate and prosecute crimes, but sometimes foreign intelligence, foreign policy, and foreign crime uh, uh, investigation are the one and the same. So, for example, uh, when there are, when there's a terrorist uh, act around the world that's targeted against American uh, interests. The American government or the American military, the FBI will send investigators to investigate to try to collect evidence so that they can find and prosecute the person responsible. So after 9-11, for example, the FBI sent many agents to the Middle East and other parts of the world to investigate people suspected of being involved in 9-11, in the 9-11 attacks, uh, and because of the evidence that the FBI was able to uh, gather up, uh, many of these people were arrested and uh, prosecuted in the United States, and they are now serving uh, prison sentences inside the United States because of the work that the FBI did. Uh, the United States government also works with the international organizations to make foreign policy and to solve foreign problems around the world uh, that are in the U.S. interest. Uh, th three examples of four of international organizations are the United Nations, the World Health Organization, and the International Criminal Court. So the United Nations is a world body that is represented by all, basically all countries in the world, and it's a place where all the world's countries can get together and use diplomacy and negotiation to solve world problems peacefully before they escalate into war. So, for example, uh, when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, uh, the United States and the rest of the world first tried to solve this crisis peacefully through the United Nations and only when that failed did the U.S. then go to economic leverage and ultimately military uh, policy. Uh, 
1950 when uh, North Korea invaded South Korea, uh, triggering the Korean War, uh, a war that the United States only got involved with. Before the U.S. got involved, the U.S. tried to solve the uh, and end the Korean War through the United Nations. So the United Nations doesn't always succeed in stopping uh, crises. It, it often does, but not always. Uh, but that's its purpose, to try to solve crises around the world uh, before they escalate into violent conflict. The World Health Organization is designed to monitor health crises around the world like COVID-19. So uh, the World Health Organization is very involved in trying to uh, and trying to stop the COVID-19 pandemic, which is not just a pandemic here in the United States, but around the world. The World Health Organization also is involved in trying to deal with the uh, spread of AIDS around the world and other, uh, uh, other viruses like Ebola and things like that. So the World Health Organization is uh, a very important organization that the U.S., uh, was part of, but now President Trump is trying to pull the U.S. out of the World Health Organization. Uh, another uh, international organization, very important one, is the International Criminal Court, uh, which is uh, centered in uh, Switzerland, uh, which is, uh, uh, no, Austria, sorry, Vienna. Uh, which is all, also where the World Health Organization is, the United Nations, is centered here in New York City. Uh, the International Criminal Court, uh, its responsibility is to prosecute people who are accused of international crimes, particularly war crimes. Uh, so, uh, And the International Criminal Court is something that was created by the world mm -hmm after World War II because of the experience of the Holocaust uh, and, the, um, and, the, and the types of war crimes that Germans, uh, that the Nazis engaged in with the Holocaust. So uh, in the 1990s, for example, uh, the U.S. got involved in a war in Bosnia uh, in Sarri, and Bosnia and Kosovo uh, part of what used to be the country of Yugoslavia in an effort to protect uh, the minority Muslim population from uh, uh, really brutal violence by the uh, Bosnian-Serbian uh, majority population. Uh, and uh, after the war ended, it, the International Criminal Court arrested and charged many of the Bosnian Serb leaders with war crimes. Uh, the uh, indiscriminate killing of civilians and the torturing of civilians, of innocent civilians. And so that is something the U.S. was heavily involved in through its participation in the International Criminal Court. So these are three organizations of w through which the United States works together with other countries in the world to help uh, deal with international crises and international problems. So what is America's current place in the world? Since 1945, the U.S. has been a superpower. After World War II, the U.S. went from being just one of the many very strong, important powers in the world to being one of two superpowers along with the Soviet Union. What does it mean to be a superpower? It means to have enormous power so much that you are a leader of the world. Uh, and the U.S.'s power comes both from economic power and from military power. And in fact, in 1945, the U.S. was the only country in the world that had nuclear weapons. And that's one of the things that made the U.S. a superpower after World War II. Now, before World War II, the U.S. was an isolationist power. Go, go back, going back to how I started this lecture, talking about what isolationism is. 
uh, the feeling that you should not be very involved in the world, that you should only use your military in defense of an attack, that you shouldn't use your military to try to solve other problems in the world that you're not involved in. Uh, you shouldn't try to use your military to, to defend other countries in the world that have been attacked, but you don't have any any part of that conflict. So before World War II, the U.S. was a very isolationist power, didn't have a very big standing military, uh, but World War II changed all that. The two presidents who led America through the Second World War, first Franklin Roosevelt and then Harry Truman, convinced the American people that the U.S. needed to become an internationalist power after World War II, not just a country that would go back after the war and not be engaged in the rest of the world, but that now the U.S. as a superpower had to be actively engaged in the world. So the United States started doing things after the war that had never been done, that had never done before, building military bases around the world, stationing troops around the world, giving lots of foreign aid to other countries in the world. These are things that weren't done before World War II, but now are a common practice of the United States since World War II all the way up to the present day. And the reason for this was the Cold War, the war that the U.S. entered into against the Soviet Union after World War II. wasn't a war like the World War II where the U.S. and the Soviet Union were actively fighting each other, but instead they were uh, fighting each other through economic uh, battle, through ideological battle, because the United States was a capitalist country, the Soviet Union was a communist country, and they were both aiding other countries that were on their side. So the U.S. had its allies, the Soviet Union had its allies, and sometimes allies of the two fought in wars like in Vietnam or in Korea, but it was not a war, a, a, a violent war directly between the United States and the Soviet Union. So during the Cold War, the U.S. saw itself as a defender of the Western liberal capitalist system, meaning that the U.S. saw itself as a defender of America's values, of, a, of a capitalism, of liberal uh, democracy, meaning a democracy that gives its people freedoms. And it saw itself as a defender against the communist system of the Soviet Union. And so throughout the Cold War, this was the battle between capitalism and communism. The Cold War lasted from 1945 to 1991 and ended in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. And so the United States won the Cold War uh, and came out of the Cold War as the world's only superpower, at least for a time. U.S. foreign policy entered into a new era after the September 11th, 2001 attacks. Uh, after those attacks, President George W. Bush started the War on Terror, a war on terrorism, uh, to fight uh, the threat of terrorism, not just against the United States, but against other countries around the world. The war on terror dramatically changed the nation's foreign and domestic policy. For example, Congress passed the Patriot Act in October 2001, less than a month after the, uh, the attacks on, of September 11th. What this law did was increase the use of domestic intelligence gathering so that the United States government can more aggressively investigate suspected terrorism. And so what the law did was make it much easier for the United States government to investigate suspected terrorists inside the United States, even if those suspected terrorists were American citizens. So in many ways, it loosened up the freedoms, it restricted, it, 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 restricted the freedoms 
it lessened the freedoms that you and I have uh, under the Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, uh, Sixth Amendment, uh, the uh, freedoms that I talked about uh, throughout the uh, this semester. Uh, so it made it easier for the government to get a search warrant uh, if the government suspected you of being a terrorist, of engaging in terrorism or helping terrorism or trying to launch your own terrorist attack. It uh, made it easier for the government to wiretap people's phones. It made it easier for the government to search someone's computer or phone or internet uh, history or even somebody's library uh, uh, card history. So under the Patriot Act, uh, the government could uh, look at what books you're reading, uh, what books you've borrowed from the library. Uh, the U.S. also increased the use of foreign intelligence gathering. The U.S. increased the size of the CIA and sent more spies out into the world to try to spy on uh, suspected terrorists. Uh, the U.S. also increased the number of FBI agents who uh, worked on uh, terrorism investigations. And then in 2002... President Bush proclaimed the Bush Doctrine. Uh, a doctrine is a statement of how the U.S. is going to engage in foreign policy, how a president uh, is going to engage in foreign policy. So the Bush Doctrine was a statement about how George W. Bush would engage and fight the war on terror. And so the Bush Doctrine contained two parts to it. The first part state, stated that uh, when it came to the threat of terrorism against America, other countries were either with us or against us, meaning that countries could either help us fight terrorism or they would be seen as our enemy. There was no neutrality. A country could not be neutral in the war on terror. The U.S. had to be either on our side or against us, with us or against us. The other part of the Bush Doctrine proclaimed the right to engage in what's called preemptive war, meaning to go to war against a country that hasn't first gone to war against us. So for the most part, not always, but for the most part during the course of American history, the United States did not go to war against a country unless that country attacked us first. So in War One, the U.S. did not engage in the war until Germany began to uh, attack American naval ships. In World War II, the U.S. didn't declare war against Japan until after Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Uh, but now with the Bush Doctrine, the president was saying, from now on, we will not wait for a country to attack us. If we suspect that a country is trying to do us harm, if a country we think means us harm, we will attack them first. Uh, and that's kind of what happened in Iraq in 2003, where the U.S. believed that Iraq was, engage was going to try to engage in terrorist attacks against the United States. And rather than uh, wait around for that to happen, the U.S. would first attack Iraq to remove Iraq as a threat. So the war on terror resulted in the U.S. fighting two Middle East wars, the war against Iraq in 2003, but first, before that, the war in Afghanistan in 2004 when the U.S. Uh, invaded Afghanistan in October 2001 in an effort to go after al-Qaeda's leaders, particularly Osama bin Laden, who was believed to be in 
Afghanistan in 2001, in October 2001, and we now pretty much think that he was, but that he was able to escape into Pakistan as, uh, after the U.S. invaded, and it was in Pakistan ultimately where he was found and killed uh, when the Obama administration and CIA uh, hunted him down and killed him uh, uh, during the Obama administration. Uh, so the U.S. has been involved in Afghanistan and Iraq since the U.S. first went in in 2001 in the case of Afghanistan in 2003 in Iraq. And in fact, today, the U.S. presence in Afghanistan is America's longest war, much longer than World War I or World War II, much longer than the Vietnam War longer than any other war. And President Trump right now is trying to end America's military involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, that's something he was, a, 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 he, he ran on promising to do that. And it was one reason he was elected president, uh, I think, is because the American people were uh, tired of being involved in two foreign wars so far away from the United States for so long. Uh, and uh, we'll see now that we're coming to the end of of uh, President Trump's first term, whether he's able to end uh, the war before uh, he either loses uh, to Joe Biden or if he wins, whether he can do that during his second term in office uh, because President Barack Obama also uh, promised uh, while he was president to end those wars and uh, he was not successful uh, for many reasons. And so we'll see if President Trump is is successful. Okay. Uh, so today, these are the biggest global challenges facing the United States right now. Obviously, COVID-19, the virus, so uh, global challenges do not have to be military threats. They can be economic threats or, in the case of COVID-19, health threats, uh, a global health threats, a virus. Uh, Iran, which I said before, uh, is believed by the United States and other countries in the world to be trying to develop uh, a nuclear weapon uh in an effort to possibly use against uh, its enemies uh, in the United States is considered an enemy by uh, Iran. North Korea, which also has nuclear weapons, already has nuclear weapons, and uh, President Trump has tried to engage North Korea in diplomacy, uh, unfortunately unsuccessfully so far. Russia is a threat because uh, potentially military, but also uh, politically. Russia, uh, we know, has uh, tried to uh, interfere and did interfere in the 2016 elect presidential election to some degree, and we think they're trying to interfere in the 2020 uh, election. China is also a threat because China is trying to expand its military uh, around the world, and China is also a very big economic threat to the United States, uh, to the U.S. economy. Uh, so all these uh, all these challenges are, uh, are are threats to America's foreign policy interests, uh, and so the U.S. government is very heavily involved in trying to deal and solve all these threats today. And, and time will only tell how successful they are. Uh, so that's the end. This is our last uh, lecture of the semester. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, being in this class this semester. Uh, and uh, good luck on the fourth exam, your final exam that's coming up uh, next week.